Hey, 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 YouTube. Just a quick video. I had um, went and made, a, not went and made, but I went and visited with some women that I didn't know. We had this, I guess you call it a meeting. It was a meeting of, of women, a women's support group. And these women, they were here. A lot of them were here in Dallas. And some of them were from different countries. But we just had a meeting and, and it, it was nice. I was glad that I was invited. And I didn't, the lady that invited me was my friend from Zimbabwe. She has had this. It was raining that day and storming. And, and I told her I couldn't make it because I don't like to drive when it's raining. But anyway, she made sure that another woman from Zimbabwe came and picked me up. This woman had to drive almost an hour coming from a di different direction to my house and then another hour to go to this event. So she spent two hours driving in the rain to pick me up. And when I got there, oh my God, the women were just screaming. Get, my friend Gertrude had just Miss Mary, Miss Mary. And, and they were, it was like I was some kind of celebrity. And when they saw me, they screamed, oh, this is Miss Mary, and this is Miss Mary. And I just said, wow, I just didn't, I didn't understand it. But we all had such a wonderful time. I just, I don't know. These are women I had never met, met except for Gertrude. It was about 10 of us, 10 women. And this lady that owned this tea room had set a section for us to uh show books and talk about books because Gertrude helps women to do TED talks and just get you prepared for public speaking and I ended up being the last person to speak I, I just I don't know I, I don't like to talk long and some of the women just ooh, ooh, talk 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 but I enjoyed it and then I got a chance to speak last and I had a good time and we got to do this again. I, I just can't travel like they do. Uh, after we did that meeting, Gertrude had to go to Maryland. She had three more stops in Atlanta and D.C. and then back to L.A. From L.A. to Fiji and Fiji to Australia. So she goes. She, she hits those spots. Can you imagine one time? I used to be her road dog. I don't know how I did it. Boy, we went all over the United States and California, Pittsburgh, New York, back and forth. I just, I never felt like that. And, and she, she's very, she can improvise because I, I'm not good at this walking. So she would always have an attendant to bring me a wheelchair. She would wheel me all over the, uh, airport we get the board first and everything i said oh Gertrude, you're so smart she said yes miss mary I, I know how to maneuver here so i don't i don't know if she wanted me to be her road dog again so we could get some wheelchair service but i can't do that anymore i, I gotta stay near home but i was letting y'all know what a good time i had fellowshipping with these women and listen to their stories just amazing i met a woman from england and she's a oh a concert pianist and it was oh man I, and you know what i want to keep in touch with these people so i'm gonna text them i have their phone numbers and stuff and i do need to meet new people even if it is just through the you know telephone and video calling i, I can't just well i could maneuver around dallas but i just don't drive in the rain <laughs> But I was just, uh, I made a minute, four minutes, thinking about the things that I did and the strength that I had. And I was a fearless woman. I really was. And I'm still, I'm fearless. I just, I just don't deal with people like I used to. But when I had that shop, I had a, the upholstery and the refinishing shop combined. So it was about 20 of us working at one time. We had a lot of people, full staff. And somehow or another, the school district <clears throat> had called me. I didn't call them. They called me and asked if I could take some of their students 
that's in their upholstery class because they just did the uh, beginning classes. And could I train some of them? So I said, yes, yes, yes. And I brought, I think about two students. They were Vietnamese people. And it was fun working with them. Only thing they, the way they worked was different. So I had to train them how we worked and it worked real well. But only thing about the, the guy that was from Vietnam, you know, we had two restrooms, the men and the women restroom. So I started getting complaints from some of the men about footprints being on the toilet seat. Somebody standing on the seat in the toilet. And I said, why would somebody stand on the toilet seat? So, I don't know. I just kind of was so busy. I didn't have time to, you know, worry about that. I said, y'all fix it. Y'all men, y'all find out who's been standing on the toilet seat. This thing kept going, kept going. And my youngest son, he said, Mom, you know that's Tam doing that. And Tam is a little Vietnamese boy. And I thought about it. I said, why would he stand on the toilet seat? And Tony said, Mama, that's the way they used the bathroom. They used to squat and, and use the bathroom and hold. I thought about it. I said, oh, my God. So he he's a little bitty man. So I guess they could just squat. And so I finally got the courage to talk to him about that. I said, Tam, his name was Tam Wynn, but we call him Tom. I said, Tom, when you get ready to use the bathroom, don't stand on the seat. Or if you have to, wipe the seat off. Because nobody wants to sit where your, your feet been. No, okay, Mary, I do, I do, I do. But he was fun to work with. And he was very, oh, man. He would work in my shop after he graduated from high school. And then he took a course in auto um, automobile refinishing cars. He started doing it and still doing upholstery. And what he would do, the people in his community, they lived in East Dallas, and <laughs> he would cash all their income tax. He would take their checks and deposit in his bank and give them the money. This boy would have three, four thousand dollars in his pocket. I said, Tam, don't do that. I said, Yeah, you don't do that. So he finally stopped doing that, but he wasn't afraid. That boy, and he finally came to Mary. I need some more money. I need some more money. <laughs> I said, Tam, you know, you got to do more work. Do more work, because what Tam would do, he'd be in con competition with the uh, Mexican upholsterers. They, ooh, they, pop, 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 pop. they were knocking that furniture out. And what I paid them was on piece rate. You did a sofa, you got a uh, hundred dollars a chair, you got fifty or whatever. So these Mexican was grabbing that furniture time it came in and he that made his paycheck, you know, kind of small. But when we had to shop, the more work we got out, the more money I could filter in for uh, you know, the business expenses. And some of them you I had uh <laughs> an older black upholster. He didn't like that idea. He liked for the furniture to sit there and save it for him and he liked the shop where you didn't have a lot of posters but um it was crazy there but i was able to deal with these men and i had a, a two seamstress they were in competition too but um the guy from uh the rehab in jail i can't think of his name some councilman he came to my shop and asked me could i train some of the men that are on parole they coming out and I, my son, my oldest son, he said, Mama, because uh, my oldest son, he's big, man. My youngest son is big, too. But I said, if I, I told him, I said, if I take these people, y'all going to have, when you get off out of school, you got to come here and show a presence. Because uh, wa a woman run in the shop. Oh, that, that, <laughs> that cell phone makes me so mad. I'm not even talking to you. And she says, I don't understand that. But anyway. So I, I made sure the boys were around to see a male presence because uh, I had one guy training him, the ones that don't know anything about upholstery. I just let them rip down. They were the rippers, the strippers. So he, this guy worked six months. And I know the game. You work six months, and then if you get laid off, you can draw your unemployment. So I was watching him. 
And I told my son, I said, you watch. It's coming. He's six months coming up, and he's going to do something to make me fire him. And sure enough, he did. I had him to unload a truck and rearrange the chair so we'd have a, a more room. This boy got to throwing furniture and breaking it. I can't even think of his name. I said, you know, you know you're fired, don't you? You know that. So just get your sh Yeah, I said, get your shit and get out. I'm right on. I, you know, I, I'm so so uh, about a week later, the uh, Texas uh, unemployment agency called me and told me he was filing for his unemployment and why was I had to get a reason why he was fired. I told him, I said, because you were destroying my furniture, and I started to call the police, but I went on fire him, and he left. And they denied him his unemployment. But that's the kind of stuff I had to go through. Being a woman running at a poster shop like that, but I was, I was hard. I was real hard. I, I, I ain't going to lie. I was. You had to be. You couldn't be no, no weak woman doing this because... I remember one time I was out in the dock. I had my little apron on. And I'm sweeping the dock out. We had a front dock and a back dock, uh, a back door. And this man, big old truck, he had a lot of furniture. He came. He wanted me to move out the way because I'm sweeping the, the garage, the dock. He said, I need to pull this truck in here so I can unload this furniture. I said, well, you can't unload here. You got to go around and go through the alley and go through the back door because the furniture, we don't want it in the front. I'm not going to no lot, ma'am, alley. I'll talk to your boss. <laughs> boy, so he backed, while he backed the truck up to park in front of the shop, boy, I put that broom down, was running, pulling off that apron. I ran, people in the shop wondering, what the hell is wrong with Mary? I ran in my office, sat there, and just looked at him when he came in. Uh, he looked, he was shocked. I said, like I said, if you want to deliver this furniture, you go through the alley and then drop, uh, unload it. And when you get through, I know you got some papers for me to sign. This boy turned red, but wasn't nothing he could do. So I, it was... I, I wasn't really mean to people, but you I still had to stand my ground. There was a woman one time. I used to do a lot of uh, oh, when you call it fire retard, uh, when fire damage and water damage on furniture. So I was working for this company to do doing their job. So he called me. He said, uh, "Mary, I got a lady. She's kind of hard to work with, but she needs some repair from water damage." And we want you to do it. Gave me the woman's number. And I called her and told her, yeah, I can do it on such and such a date. I'll be out there to look at it. When that day came, I had a MS exacerbation. I had vertigo so bad, I could not hardly walk. So I called her and told her I couldn't make it that day because I had a real bad vertigo attack. So we're going to have to reschedule she got to, she turned into a Karen. It wasn't Karen, wasn't I in those days. She said, well, uh, I'm going to call your boss and tell him that you are not doing your job because it's not right for you to schedule, uh, schedule an appointment and then change it. I say, uh, you going to call my boss and tell him? Yes, I'm going to call him. I say, well, you can call him, okay, and Maybe he'll find somebody else. I don't know. I left it just like that because I didn't feel like arguing with that woman. The next day, the company that wanted me to do the repair called and said, Mary, don't even argue with her. What we're going to do is bring the furniture to you and let you do the repair. And she never know you did it. You don't even have to deal with her. I said, well, okay. I said, but. I'll, I'll, I'll do the repair and I'll just be the invisible man. So that's the way I had to do. But people, I don't know. And that was so, most of my customers were nice. But the ones that got out of hand, I had to really always be on guard to let them know who running this thing. And that was not easy. It was not easy. And, and I finally 
just realized this the purpose of this job me doing this was to help my children because i was a single mother raising two male children my neck hurt male children and we were living in a rough neighborhood so i i, I just had to keep this job going and both of both of the boys could uh they knew how to run it how to do upholstery and refinish and all that but i didn't want them to carry that kind of work on so i'm i push i push and i push and they both graduated from college my oldest son uh he's passed on now but he graduated from smu and that's one of the most prestigious i can't even say the word prestigious school here in dallas but he he got a scholarship and he had a full ride my youngest baby he graduated from unt and he has a uh bachelor's and a master's the master's in special education so i said that and and then let me show you something i want to show you something but uh when i was writing that book i didn't re i was it was hard but i didn't realize that i was writing and preparing stuff for the future this is i'm gonna read you the back page she said it says back of the book she couldn't change what happened even if she could fix this mess where would she start the future would only take them further from their past right now she didn't have the luxury to fall apart wait until they finish college then she'd go crazy take some medicine and get well no one would be around to know she was ever sick. I don't even know why I wrote that, but that's the way I feel. I said, I, I need to go crazy, but I can't go crazy right now. And after they finished college and had the work, and I, I was really working on my uh, addiction, my load got lighter and I, I let the shop go. And start a few decorators they followed me to my house and you know the people wanted slip covers because there wasn't too many people doing slip covers so they followed me wherever i went and, and now i still get people wanting me to do slip covers but anyway i i i i in the book back of the book i said i was gonna go crazy get well take some matter nobody ever know i was sick and i started taking anxiety medication and all this stuff and i still didn't go crazy and i said i wonder how in the hell am i gonna go crazy and when my son passed he passed i see i saw him die right there on the floor that was when i should have went crazy that was a time to just go fucking crazy and do you know God carried me through that. He, he, no, you're not going to go crazy. We're not going to let that happen to you. And I, I think about it now. I say, Dog, why, why didn't I go crazy? And it's not in me to do that. I mean, I have my times when I'm just, oh, just, oh, beat up and devastated. And my spirit allows me to do that, to uh, cry, suffer, or whatever. But just go crazy. Can't do it. I don't know how many of y'all can uh, relate to what I'm talking about because I see people on the internet and television. They look like they done went crazy. And, but I thank God. God carried me through a lot of things. And my, I'm still a strong woman. But it's, it's a mental strength now. And I, I can't deal with a lot of people so i don't even know what the name of this video is it's just chit chatting i guess but y'all um uh, continue to pray for me and my family and i'll i'll be thinking about you all and just wishing wishing the best and when i get these ones out the wishing ones i'm gonna bring some uh i'll show you to my it uh my etsy store and i'm gonna put it on my website too but everybody stay safe and 
as uh like this move I can't think of it. the little boy say, Hold on, lady, be going for a ride. I can't the name can't think of the name of that movie, but that's what we have to hold on because we going for a ride. Buckle up, okay? I will let you guys go and have a good, good night, okay? Bye-bye.